Welcome to The Appetite, a podcast that asks for more from life in relation to food, body, and mental health. We are clinicians from Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder clinic in the University District of Seattle, Washington. The Appetite is an ongoing relational conversation where questions beget questions and where we explore the nuances of having a relationship to oneself. Here, we offer a window into our work because we found that the issues and themes that arise in the treatment of eating disorders are really, when it comes down to it, issues that anyone can relate to. Because when someone starts exploring their relationship to food or to their body, it's almost inevitable that a person will start asking questions about what it means to have a healthy appetite for life itself, especially in the midst of an American culture of diet, restriction, and unsatisfying answers around what it means to be. And so, yes, this podcast is about food sometimes, but it's also about how to respond to the wisdom of your body, how to engage movement, your own mental health, and the relationship you have to the people in your life and to yourself. I'm your host, Carter Umhau, a therapist at Opal Food and Body Wisdom, as well as an artist and a writer. I'll be facilitating weekly conversation with the founders of Opal, psychologist Dr. Lexi Giblin, who has been intensively trained under radically open dialectical behavioral therapy creator Dr. Thomas Lynch and is a member of his RODBT senior clinician team. Licensed marriage and family therapist Kara Bazzi, who is also the director of Opal's sport and exercise program. And finally, dietitian Julie Church, nutrition director and community relations director at Opal, who is a health at every size practicing clinician. Today's conversation is about who we are and how we got here. (laughs) Okay. Okay, so this is our first podcast, um, and I'd love to just allow each of us to introduce ourselves um, and get a name to each of our voices. I'm Carter Umhow. I'm going to be hosting the podcast, and I am a therapist at Opal. I'm also an artist and writer. And I'm uh, Dr. Lexi Giblin, and I'm executive director and co-founder and psychologist at Opal. And I'm Kara Bazzi. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and clinical director and co-founder of Opal. And I'm Julie Church, registered dietitian nutritionist, and I am co-founder, nutrition director, and community relations director for Opal. A lot of titles. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They've added over the years. (laughs) So um, we're going to be talking about a lot of things on this podcast, Um, but I I would imagine that the first thing to know is is what is Opal? What is Opal? Why are we here talking? Um, Mm -hmm. And how do you guys know each other? Mm -hmm. Who wants to take it? Julie Church. (laughs) What is, well, Opal? what is Opal? What is Opal? It's a local eating disorder treatment program in Seattle, Washington, that offers higher level of care for individuals struggling with food, body, weight, and exercise concerns. And beyond that, it's a place where the human spirit triumphs mm. daily, mm. I would say. Mm. Um, it's a place where healing happens. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So one of my biggest curiosities, um, I think especially not knowing much about higher level of care initially before I started this work as well, is what would bring someone into this work um, as a therapist that Mm -hmm. myself, like I imagine that I'd probably go straight into private practice and that Mm -hmm. would be that. Um, Mm -hmm. What has brought each of you to the eating disorder work in particular? Mm -hmm. So I was always really drawn to the sciences and math and early in college found out that I wasn't going to be the chemist making shampoos and soaps that I thought it was going to be because I wanted to be with people and found actually a little interest survey thing that nutrition could be interesting. And right away when I took my first nutrition class, I was drawn more to the psychology of eating Mm -hmm. and drawn to my um, fellow classmate who was struggling with eating disorder and the gal in my sorority who was struggling with an eating disorder and found myself supporting uh, one of my high school friends who was struggling with an eating disorder. <laughs> um, and with that, I instantly kind of knew that eating disorders probably was going to be the expression of um, my use of my degree in nutrition. And as I um, 
looked for what my education was going to provide, I saw that there wasn't going to be a lot of training eating disorders. And so I pursued internships and special experiences to, to do it. And each step kind of continued to confirm that. So. I mean, I get asked this question regularly and I, I never feel like I have the answer um, mm -hmm. that feels like really speaks to mm -hmm. my path. Um, and I think that the way that I can best summarize it is um, that eating disorders um, are at a crossroads with many issues in life that are deeply meaningful to me personally. So at the crossroads of eating disorders are relationships, um, belonging, over control, um, disempowerment, feminism, oppression, all of these issues that have that have deep core meaning for me personally. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that I'm I'm more connected and was drawn to the work because of the kind of the the underpinnings of eating disorders mm -hmm. than rather than the symptoms themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what keeps me passionate every day because I can see how those are getting played out and that's where the change really occurs, right? Mm -hmm. Is is working with those those more core issues. So mm -hmm. yeah. Did you feel surprised to find that eating disorders and that work was the place where you were going to be engaging all those topics? I yeah, surprised in, in that I look back and I don't I don't remember saying at one point like I'm going to work I'm going to do eating work mm -hmm. with eating disorders and mm -hmm. it was more it has felt more like an organic um, process to mm -hmm. this place. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a clear like set about journey to where I am. And that's why I can't believe we're, you know, once again, I have all these surprise moments, right? such as this one, mm -hmm. where I, how is it that we're all together mm -hmm. doing this podcast together? Right. Um, so mm -hmm. surprised mm -hmm. and excited and um, kind of, yeah, pinch me kind of experiences <laughs> regularly. Well said. Kara, what about you? How did you wind up in this work? Mm -hmm. Well, these gals know that, I mean, a big part of me getting into the field was my own personal experience with um, suffering from an eating disorder. And uh, my experience of developing an eating disorder had to do in the context of sport. I was a long distance runner and I actually didn't even know that I had an eating disorder um, for a lot of my um, time as a, as a long distance runner, especially at the collegiate level. And so once I identified that it actually was a problem and went through my own healing journey, I just developed um, a really big um, desire to help people that were like me and um, both the people that were suffering from eating disorders and were in silence around it uh, and also uh, on the side of outreach and helping um coaches and other people within the sport context and the sport community to be more aware of the issues that are going on because I think a lot of people are suffering without um, either knowing it themselves or the people around them knowing. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to be a part of that and um, again can't I kind of can't believe where we've come to with uh, having a place like Opal and this um, big platform from which to um, reach people. Mm -hmm. It makes me want to ask already about how you guys wound up starting Opal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know. I don't should know. Should I dive into that? I feel like maybe you should. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. The story of Opal did happen in a similar way, just organically, but it was over time that the three of us found each other in our own private practices, our own independent businesses, mm -hmm. and we found each other because we would share clients. So some client maybe found Lexi, would start with Lexi, and then Lexi would connect that client to work with me as their dietitian. And then we began to trust each other in the work and similarly with Kara and I. And uh, just we continue to draw closer and trusting our, each other's work in a consultation group and all that. And then as we would try to find the right care for our clients, we would begin new groups or have new offerings and we, among what we could offer. But then we would send people away to other treatment programs mm -hmm. um, out of state at the time. Mm -hmm. it, they needed to go out of state for that higher level of care need. And we just would get kind of disenchanted by the experience of what that was. And mm -hmm. we just kept thinking to each other, really, just in small ways, but 
gosh, if we could do this, maybe mm. we could open something that would offer the kind of treatment we think that would um, truly change people and give transformational healing mm. in terms of these issues. And so there was a quarter that Lexi decided to not be a professor at UW and to not take on a class that quarter. And during that spring, we said, okay, why don't we just mm -hmm. take steps towards it? Mm -hmm. And we met regularly and doors kept opening. And mm -hmm. and then uh, about 11 to 12 months later, we opened mm -hmm. Opal. So, I've never heard that story. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I've never heard it. Oh, I've always assumed that you guys were friends first mm -hmm. and yeah. clinicians, all clinicians mm -hmm. and friends, and mm -hmm. then decided to create it. It's really cool to think about it kind of happening mm -hmm. naturally to start collaborating a little bit mm -hmm. and then collaborating a little bit more mm -hmm. and then realizing that you wanted to do more and more and make your yeah. own place. Well, and we were so like-minded. I think mm -hmm. none of us would have probably opened Opal without each other, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. we had really um, discovered the, uh, an alignment in the way that we saw the treatment of eating disorders. And um, and I, I, I continue thinking there's no way I could do this without them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're a, a, as a as a company, we are founded on our relationships, Julie, Kara, and I's relationships mm -hmm. with one another, um, and we take those relationships very seriously and mm -hmm. take good try to take really good care of them. Mm -hmm. And I think that from there, that's where a lot of the health of our business and the health of our community is is born. Like without that, we have to, you know, mm -hmm. we have. That's what we're we're mm -hmm. helping people change their relationships with others and mm -hmm. and we try to lead mm -hmm. through by modeling mm -hmm. the, the taking care of our own relationships mm -hmm. i remember the moment that we signed our 10-year mm -hmm. lease on yes. our office space oh <laughs> and it felt like marriage. wow this is more than marriage <laughs> more i don't marriage. remember Here feeling that yeah. signing, signing my marriage license i remember no. thinking wow this is a big big mm -hmm. big deal yeah. and commitment we're making to mm -hmm. one another's business partners mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it started with 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. So, Lexi, you were just saying that relationship is part of the core <clears throat> of Opal. Um, and at least from the media standpoint, I would imagine that a lot of people would be surprised to hear that eating disorder treatment and relationship have a lot to do with each other. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that people would imagine that. Can you mm -hmm. speak more to how those two feel yeah. Combined, relevant. Yeah. I I mean I guess as a as a psychologist I just I think of change typically happens in relationships mm -hmm. all kinds of change including um, change of eating disorder symptoms but so that's a bias I bring right. into this it just that's just what tends to happen um, and then be more specifically to eating disorders a lot of our clients um, are dealing with emotional loneliness and uh, struggle with belonging. Um, and that is maybe part at the core of their struggle and mm -hmm. their eating disorder is an expression or a, 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 a path, an attempt mm -hmm. to find connection mm -hmm. and relationship, to find belonging, to find decrease in anxiety so they can mm -hmm. connect, you know, all, all of all of that. And, and you know, Carter, as you know, at Opal, we're doing a lot of radically open dialectical behavioral therapy and working to integrate that. And that's the main treatment target is emotional loneliness. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I mean, Julie, Karen, and I, we, we were already, this has been such a natural fit mm -hmm. for us because we already think of it as mm -hmm. a struggle of emotional loneliness and difficulty mm -hmm. of connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so to find a treatment that has evidence in the literature and fits our already existing mm -hmm. strong belief systems just been, mm -hmm. just been wonderful. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I think also a, a very oversimplification that I've always used <laughs> in my career about eating disorders is this, that... It's a means to simplify the complexities of life into a body shape and size. Wow. And mm -hmm. so, and I just think of the complexities of life usually relate to other people. And so people find an eating disorder as a means to try to numb the pain that is there within a relationship context, but they do it by trying to change their body or the way they're mm -hmm. eating. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't actually target, it doesn't actually fix the relationship, of course. Um, mm -hmm. It leaves them emotionally lonely and, but it is a means to try to simplify that um, mm -hmm. because it's a lot easier to change the way you're eating or even for most people to change the way their body looks than to maybe get out of an abusive relationship or to change the path of a relationship that isn't going the way they want. So. Mm -hmm. 
Which is why this is so exciting because it's relevant to everyone, right? The way that it manifests might be different for the clients that we're working with, but the core issues are something that relates to all mm -hmm. humankind of the, the need for connection, for belonging. And I just think of how even particularly in culture today with the, with kids and youth, that is just such a um, core core issue with the introduction of all this technology and everything. So I, I'm looking forward to having those type of conversations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on this podcast. Mm -hmm. It is something that is relevant to everyone. Um, I think that like one of the thing, the main things that we talk about is Opal is it's not about the food. Mm -hmm. It's not about the food, right? We right. say that so much. Um, and of course we know that it's about the relationship mm -hmm. and it, I love what you said, Julie. I don't think I've heard you say that either mm -hmm. um, in such a succinct way. It's one of the things that I got excited about mm -hmm. when I first started working with eating disorders as well, mm -hmm. that it's this place where you can see all of these different dynamics become manifest mm -hmm. because we all need to express ourselves some way. Right. Um, and to have one area of our life that we have to engage in mm -hmm. eating in our mm -hmm. bodies, we can't escape those two things. Right. And so, so much gets projected right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And our culture emphasis emphasizes that it's a simplistic relationship to eating too, that changes body shape, which, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, there's a lot of simplistic equation about diet and, and exercise as the two things that impact our shape. And um, I know that we're trying to really kind of poke holes in those simplistic belief systems with our clients. And um, I know that's something we're excited about with this podcast, too, is to be a little provocative and, mm -hmm. and open up some some ch more challenging conversations about why that isn't, it's not that simple. Our bodies aren't that simple. Our bodies are actually a lot more complex too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about um, with you guys, when you think about the complexity of dealing with um, the body and eating disorder behaviors and eating disorder treatment and just in the specifics of it, are there particular topics that you guys get most excited about that you feel like you can kind of smuggle into mm -hmm. your work um, because it does hold so much? Mm -hmm. Mine pretty quickly piggybacks on where Kara was yeah. going um, for me. But pretty early, actually, in my education, I got I was kind of reactionary to the traditional thought around weight and health and connecting a particular body size to health. Mm -hmm. And so I always pursued alternative perspectives on that somehow. And about the time I was in my um, education, the Health at Every Size movement was starting, which is um, a paradigm shift from the traditional um, conventional thought that there is kind of BMI connection to uh, health. There's a particular BMI that people are more healthy in, and there's a particular BMI that people are less healthy in. And so that's, I get, there's so many conversations mm -hmm. that can come out of challenging that mainstream belief uh, and how that definitely, I believe, how, how that is a necessary element to engage when somebody is trying to recover from an eating disorder. Somebody has to engage that, that question mm -hmm. to see if they can move to a, a long time, um, a recovered state from an eating disorder. And then also on the um, general population to just engage those questions. And that then interacts with the family members, the people that are struggling or just community members that I interact with. So that topic mm -hmm. of, of weight and health and kind of making that not so closely linked mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the places I get most passionate. So Yes, because there's I don't think that there's a greater assumption to dispel in mm -hmm. this culture. I mean, right. the idea, right, right yeah. there's, I, I yeah. say that to people all the time. Yeah. They're like, mm -hmm. what are you even talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, weight and health are directly mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And so. related, one of the things I get most excited about is weight and sport performance. Mm -hmm. So there's the whole belief system within the, the the sport world, too, around weight's role in peak performance. And I think there's been some shift in movement, but um, there's still, I'm hoping for greater change in the way that weight is emphasized, um, especially in lean, um, lean sports and um, weight class sports. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to have those. I'm excited to have those conversations. I know that's going to be yeah. really fun mm -hmm. to think about that because I, once again, I mean, I would love to hear the two of you talk about that. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I've gotten to hear the two of you go back and mm -hmm. forth on that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm excited to have mm -hmm. those conversations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm struck um, as I listen to you um, speak about that. How we're all the all three of us individually 
kind of often will take an issue that we're passionate about and look at it from a different angle, right. you know, in our own ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. I think that that's something that unifies us as mm-hmm. a, as a, as a group, as well mm-hmm. as leaders. Um, mm-hmm. We don't just accept the basic assumptions right. that maybe mm-hmm. the, the, that society at large, what we may be pushing, willing to push up against it yep. and take a look at a different angle. And I think, mm-hmm. and for me, um, that's, um, my passion, my passion project of of today <laughs> is radically open dialectical behavioral therapy, mm-hmm. and and that is all about um, treating disorders of over control, um, anorexia being one of those, but um, anxiety disorders fall in the camp as well. Can you explain over control? Yeah. What is that? Yeah. So it's it's um, it's be behavioral emotional inhibition. Um, it's folks who are more on the risk averse side, careful, perfectionistic, um, detail oriented, mm-hmm. uh, organized, right? <laughs> Lots of great things that our society celebrates and, and for good reason. I mean, mm-hmm. they really are helpful characteristics um, that in disorders of over control, it becomes too much of a good thing. Mm-hmm. And in RODBT, the thinking is that the, the over control is getting in the way of connection and social mm-hmm socializing and social signaling Mm -hmm. in particular so so following um this is following dr thomas lynch's um 20-year work um at looking at this issue Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. so all three of you have really particular passions Mm -hmm. and i think i don't i don't know the background too of how Mm -hmm. haze came up for you julie and then Mm -hmm. i know a little bit more for you Kara mm-hmm. around sport and then I don't know where you first heard of RO yeah. but it feels like these mm-hmm. three mm-hmm. seeds kind of coming together was that something that you were aware of immediately when you started Opal or that you guys each had these like three mm-hmm. very separate places that you were coming from did it feel separate mm. the health at every size was a stake in the ground that felt like something that mm-hmm. we all three had found each mm-hmm. other and felt really aligned with and made us different than some others in the field and mm-hmm. even within the eating disorder field, right? And certainly within each of our disciplines, the health at every size wasn't something that everyone was on board with. So mm-hmm. that was one thing that definitely brought us together and allowed each other to trust the work that we were doing with our clients. Mm-hmm. But then you've got these three branches. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know that that was one we knew yeah, of. Right. That was and then and the sport, the sport piece I think, was, was also there. also part of it because mm-hmm. I remember – um, when I was first introduced to what even health at every size was, was the context of a um, mm-hmm. talk where they were talking about a swimmer in a larger body who had swum across the English Channel. And so she was using the the example of an athlete in sport performance to talk about haze. Mm-hmm. And it just clicked, like something just completely clicked. And, and so um, most of the passion and what I understand is often through the context of my own experience <laughs> in um, – and living in a in a haze oriented, you know, living with a haze um, philosophy in my own personal life, and then through my sport sport mm-hmm. context. But I, I it's I'm continuing to learn. I mean, I think right. we all have the posture of being mm-hmm. learners and um, and growing and understanding. And you know, I was thinking the other thing. I just I was when Lexi was talking, I was thinking uh, I'm passionate about asking good questions because I think. A lot of times the simplification of an eating disorder is Mm -hmm. really this desire for black and white Mm -hmm. and concrete and certainty. And I know in my eating disorder, I was, that was part of, was part of my disorder is everything had to be so certain. Um, And so to make room for mystery and ambiguity and asking, asking questions, and usually that begets more questions. And it's not that there's, we're not trying to come to this certain, this certain position. And I think that's uncomfortable um, but it ultimately can lead to, I think, actually more comfort in having freedom. Mm-hmm. But the beginning of the journey sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's really, really, really uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I feel like is so exciting about working with eating disorders is that it feels like it's about livelihood mm-hmm. and life and vitality mm-hmm. and thinking about how, you know, these different these different realms, haze and and sport and body and, and mm-hmm. RO, they feel like different things that allow the world to be more and more complicated. Right. I feel like mm-hmm. I'm hearing e- right. each of you say that. Right. Mm-hmm. It makes the world more complicated. And, and I know that all four of us have come up against some, like some big pushbacks and mm-hmm. some 
hard moments with clients that don't necessarily want to get into Mm -hmm. life being more complicated Mm -hmm. and I don't think anybody really wants to Mm -hmm. when it comes down to it when we're struggling Mm -hmm. we're not seeking oh yeah just let's get more flexible about this let's let's make this less complicated or let's make this more complicated when I'm struggling Mm -hmm. um and so to me that the eating disorder work feels Mm -hmm. like it's constantly an ask to be dealing with these different um spiritual emotional um cultural questions about Mm -hmm. how to how to think about things with more complexity always Yeah, to get one answer and then know that there's going to be another one mm-hmm. that you need to find mm-hmm. soon and then another one. There's not really a stopping point mm-hmm. to that. Yeah. And I, I think of actually our tagline of food and body wisdom in mm-hmm. terms of the where we came to our name and just like that our hope is that's, that's where mm-hmm. we want for our clients, ourselves to just keep on finding yeah. what that is for each of us because I think in that journey of opening and continuing to ask questions, we're each going to land in different spots with some of that and understand our own attunement to emotions mm-hmm. and attunement to body and, a, and relationships and the society and culture. Mm-hmm. And so it's, um, I think that's what's so beautiful about it is being able to see that the process of all of this and the work that we can do with our clients like allows each person to become who they were created to be mm-hmm. and who they are just designed to be and bring that full person totally. <laughs> into this world. And um we each can ask those questions over and over and we can end in different spots and be Mm -hmm. so supportive of where we've seen that person land Mm -hmm. and that it can be more complicated because then it's all of us being so different Mm -hmm. or some being the same, but it's so beautiful to see it come Mm -hmm. out that way and Mm -hmm. have people trust their own wisdom that way. Mm -hmm. Right. I often think of the, um, my experience because in my undergraduate education, I was in pre-med. So I took a lot of the biology and the chemistry and the, organic chemistry and really, you know, the hard sciences. And I just remember being struck constantly by the mystery that was in science. Um, And I do think there is, uh, like what Julie's saying, um, that, that we can, that we can take science, but really, because there is so much mystery and gap too within um, research and science that like the, the best I think we can come up with and what I, what I feel I've come to in my own personal life is, using some of that external information, but then really coming to know myself better and my mm-hmm. own, and my body's response to, to food and sleep and relationships and movement and, um, and becoming my own expert on myself. And, and mm-hmm. that's what I want to give the gift to of our clients. Uh, and, and yet that does involve work. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, that's not as, it's not as sexy because it takes work to do that. And I think often we want the things that are quicker and, and the answers to be really easily accessible and, um, so I think of our clients all the time as just being so brave for doing the work mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because it takes a lot of effort mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and a lot of discomfort along the way. Yeah, it's, and it's stepping into chaos yep. and yes. something that those of us who are over-controlled despise. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Um, just as we're, as we're talking, it's reminding me of, um, self-inquiry, mm-hmm. you know, like basically what I think what we encourage is this, this, um, process of, self-inquiry, which is a radically open dialectical behavioral con- therapy con- uh, construct concept um, where you seek your personal unknown and you, you kind of travel down the, these paths of seeking what you don't yet understand about yourself, mm-hmm. getting mm-hmm. curious about what you don't yet, what's on the other side of your personal unknown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thinking about how food feels like such a perfect access to that, mm-hmm. both that it is and it isn't about the food, right? But it it is something that, um, like I said earlier, everybody is hearing these messages in our culture that a certain answer is out there for their body mm-hmm. and for their diet. And um, it is the cornerstone of how we connect to people, or hopefully it would be, food mm-hmm. would be, um, being around a table, it's kind of where it all starts. Mm-hmm. Um and to to imagine instead that people are are finding more complicated answers and mm-hmm. going into processes of self inquiry where there's not necessarily kind of a diag- um a prescription mm-hmm. around what they're supposed to eat and how they're supposed to exercise and what they're supposed to look mm-hmm. like and how they're supposed to relate to the world mm-hmm. um, you have to go further into yourself mm-hmm. in order to do that and you're usually going towards uncharted territory so that right. you don't have a strong vision for it and oftentimes especially with over-control, you'd rather do what's familiar even if you know that there could be something better because it's so scary to 
to to leave the familiar. Mm -hmm. And I think we see that all the time with our clients too, is especially when you don't have any point of reference in your past that mm. suggests it could be better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's blind faith. Like there's definitely a, a, like a faith element of, I don't, it's a sight unseen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of clients are scared to make that jump. And you're, you're going to the unfamiliar and to what's often most painful. Mm -hmm. So yeah. It's not sexy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not because <laughs> we believe that right. growth happens in pain. Good therapy hurts. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. And yeah. we've all done it. I mean, we're not right. asking our clients to do something we haven't already done. And I think that's what also makes us a strong and healthy organization is that we're doing it. We do it ourselves. So mm -hmm. it's not prescribing something that we haven't stepped, walked in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about that in light of this podcast <laughs> in this very moment, like what it feels like to be doing something so unexpected. And, and I mean, we're all in the middle of our work days, right? Mm -hmm. To come and get to talk about these things is mm -hmm. a really different, um, it's uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> so what, what does this mean for each of you to be doing a podcast? I don't, I, Kara, you came up with the first seedling of a thought, right? Did about I make that the, up? Yeah. Um, well, I think the idea, it feels like there's something about bringing what we get to witness every day in Opal to the outside world. I think there's, there's so much conversation that we're having that we think ev like anyone could relate to and benefit from. And I think that piece about, I want to ask it, like asking good questions and, um, and, and engage for people that are kind of maybe even in a place of searching or knowing that they're sick and tired of being sick and tired or they're in a place of stuckness that um, that we can help kind of engage conversations within the bigger community. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I've had a lot of energy around that recently as I've been doing some more things within the sport community and with with coaches um, as I just, Oh, and and from clients. So, you know, we have these conversations with clients and clients say, gosh, I just sure wish, you know, mm -hmm. other people could hear what we're talking about or that other people could engage or my family could could be a part of this conversation. Or um, so I just I think it's just very relevant and it's exciting to think of um, just planting some seeds, getting some thoughts going and um, yeah, considering an alternative path mm -hmm. that might not even be something people know, know could exist. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I often find myself, um, realizing that I don't, I don't get a chance to talk about these things so freely mm -hmm. in my life. Um, either I'm at work and there's a bit of an editing happening. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but then also mm -hmm. in, in my personal life, I would imagine I don't get to talk big picture all the time about these things. Yeah. Um, so it's exciting to kind of go big picture and and to get to hear kind of some more specifics from from each of you guys about about what this means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lexi, what did you think? What do you what does this mean to you? You were saying before we started that this feels like kind of a massive moment that you're trying to yeah, take it in. What it I means do. For you. I feel like it's a moment to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I said, I'm surprised. I I'm often surprised by what happens. <laughs> um, but in my own self-inquiry work, I think if I take it to a little more personal level, I, I'm, I'm working to kind of close the gap between how I experience myself and how others experience me. So I'm surprised that anyone would want to listen to this podcast, <laughs> <laughs> me in particular, you know, but I'm, I'm learning to that, that that's, that's, uh, I'm trying to take that in with, by, with, um, within myself and understand that I have potentially something to say mm -hmm. that could impact a person's life and journey mm -hmm. um, and sitting in that um, mm -hmm. and being part of that. And so I think, mm -hmm. I think my hope um, similar to Kara's is that we, we bring ideas that kind of challenge the, the order, the way that, that a, an individual might be thinking. So just pushing up against some boundaries and, you know, taking a look at something that's familiar from a slightly different angle, mm -hmm. presenting different ideas that, you know, you can certainly accept or decline as the listener, but is worth considering and, and decide mm -hmm. from there. Mm -hmm. um, and just being a part of a conversation around, around different ways of seeing and mm -hmm. thinking and looking. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of my favorite responses from clients is, Oh, I've never thought about that. 
<laughs> right? Yeah. Huh, I don't know. Yeah. But I've never thought about it like that. Yeah. Stretching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The thing that keeps coming to my mind um, is that I often will say, which is that I believe that the default in our culture is to dislike our bodies, maybe hate our bodies, and then do mm -hmm. something to fix them. Mm -hmm. And I think that body project mentality and the body fix mentality has more that mainstream idea that the body is something wrong or it's dirty or it's needs to be fixed, perfected, changed, altered, and diet, exercise. I don't know. Have they, They're a core part to what people then start to do to then fix their body. And that's where mm -hmm. I just, I think that back, I think that to... Um, early education around nutrition for kids all the way to the mass production of, I guess, in the, the industry that the mm -hmm. diet industry is. So it's just like who gets targeted with that message that the body's wrong and it needs to be fixed and in what ways. And um, so I, that's the part, I think there's so many ways. That's how it's so relevant because mm -hmm, everybody right. has had that pressure right. and that message, mm -hmm. I believe, um, all genders, all ages. Mm -hmm. And so wherever, whoever is listening, I think that there's going to be mm -hmm. um, some new ways to think about that or challenge some of that and perhaps mm -hmm. some hope mm -hmm. to not have to live in that pursuit of the body needing to be a certain way for their whole life and having that be such a central focus. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah. So once again, a shift from kind of this fixed mentality about something, the project mentality to relationship instead. And embodied. Right. Mm -hmm. Being embodied, being connected mm -hmm. both to others and to ourselves. And the only way to do that really is in the gray area. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. To be in relationship mm -hmm. with your own body means that you're actually listening. You're mm -hmm. listening for nuance mm -hmm. and you're listening for um, the sake of caring and connecting to yourself, not to fix. Right. So again, yeah. like, it totally. feels so appropriate that relationship would be at the center of mm -hmm. work around the body. Mm -hmm. um, that that's not just something that's about you and me, but it's also something that then translates to our relationship with ourself. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of people have necessarily had that experience in their personal relationships, right? No. So of course they don't know how to treat themselves no. mm -hmm. and have a relationship with their own body. Right. One thing that I remember, I'm remembering inspired for me somewhat about doing a podcast is um, just this past June, Lexi and I did a body image workshop for our oldest mm -hmm. daughters. So we're all, all three mothers and that's a big part of our experience in the world. Um, but we both have, well, we have a 10 and 11 year old, two daughters, separate. Daughters. <laughs> we're not together. <laughs> we're, she has an 11 year old, I have a 10 year old. And so we had a, um, gosh, what, 13 girls. Mm -hmm. um, so our daughter's friends and did a body image workshop. And I, I would say that was also a really meaningful experience to be able to catch these girls at, at that age where their um, belief systems aren't really um, strongly formed. And and to be able to have some of these conversations with them and have them uh, open up some alternative ways of thinking. Uh, and it was just remarkable to see their response. And I mean, I remember we walked away and said, I think we we likely prevented an eating disorder or two through this mm -hmm. workshop. Wow. And we probably impacted a lot of kids because here they are now. They're all, you know, pretty, they're really strong girls and they're probably leaders in their own friendship circles. And so kind of the trickle effect of um, pouring into them in that way and, 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 and then how they will influence their peer groups. Mm. I was so excited because I was there that night when, when you guys right. were setting up. Yes. Mm. And just to see your daughter like running around the yes. kitchen at Opal. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and how different that response is mm -hmm. from seeing clients walk in scared. Totally. Um, totally. And all the candy jars out and yes. being so fun yes. and, and just the difference that that kind of energy could make yeah. um, going forward. Yeah. Her growing up. I just wish everyone could have, like, that there was, everyone could see what happened in that room that night because mm -hmm. it's pretty remarkable what these mm -hmm. kids can, how just, you know, what they can absorb and what they, their minds, how they work. Mm -hmm. They're really, yeah. Their thinking is so malleable. Yeah. It's you really know, neat. it's a pristine, mm -hmm. you know, place. Mm -hmm. They're willing to ask the question and say it out loud. Yeah. They don't have that. Yeah inhibition so much yet right did you yeah. guys feel like you had access as kids to conversations about no no what was it like instead no 
I just don't feel like I talked about it that yeah. much, honestly. Yeah. I, I actually think, think that's yeah. true. I just don't think that people do actually talk a lot about their relationship with food or their relationship with body with people that they trust close to them. Mm -hmm. It's just not, mm -hmm. it's really flippant conversations that come out or it's things that kind of like protect them or like shame others or shame themselves publicly, like around mm -hmm. food and body. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I think it's pretty rare to have friendships or relationships within a family that at various ages and stages that are going to mm -hmm. talk about it in an honest, vulnerable way. So right. I think outside of like having like the sex ed kind of conversations that look connect to body. Mm -hmm. Sort of. Yeah, kind of, <laughs> right. kind of, kind of not. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. Well, and this is one of the things I I say a lot when I give presentations is the power of silence because mm -hmm. when you don't mm -hmm. have any, when you're not having conversations or anyone speaking into in, into it um, with you, then you're just connecting a bunch of dots and you're making a lot of interpretations. So maybe mm -hmm. I didn't have any explicit conversations, but I sure as heck was making observations, right? And making observations with my parents and my peers and um connecting a lot of dots that you know ended up being really in in my story pretty destructive because mm -hmm. silence in and of itself can be mm -hmm. incredibly destructive to figure out what we're going to do with that right mm -hmm. right yeah i can relate to that too i i i don't remember there being a ton of conversations mm -hmm. um but i definitely observed different things and i definitely picked up a different a lot of different comments mm -hmm. and to be able to try to negotiate myself and my own sense of self based off of all of these external, um, just like just commentary, mm -hmm. figure out, okay, who am I and what does it mean to have a body and mm -hmm. how do people see me and mm -hmm. what does this mean in my family and in my relationships and people seeing me at school, et cetera, when no one's ever directly saying this is – Right. This is what this whole thing is about. Right. Um, right. Can't imagine someone coming in and giving like a food philosophy. Yeah. In <laughs> kindergarten. Yeah. I know. That makes me excited. With my, um, yeah. when, was it my oldest? It was in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Julie yes. came with me to her kindergarten class and we did a little, little kindergarten oriented lesson. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty great. Mm -hmm. And then we also, yeah, yeah, it's been, it, it's, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunities to have going into the, I think going into the schools um, and then also reaching parents of uh, mm -hmm. elementary age kids seems that's a, another passion area, I guess, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. to your earlier question yeah. about passion, passion mm -hmm. projects, mm -hmm. that one gets me going too. Mm -hmm. And just helping like, and, and me, like we're learners too. I don't, it's not, this is all new too. It feels like one big social experiment in some ways, even <laughs> with my own kids, because I'm doing things that my mom didn't do, not because she didn't care, but she didn't have the resources. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just, I, I was just thinking about the, um, I guess working with mostly at a higher level of care at Opal, it's with adult, uh, adults. And so with that, um, we do bring in kind of the, the thoughts around parenting and sort of how, what did you learn about food and nutrition and body when you were younger? And like, how does that um, have them have opportunities to sort of think about that? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because one of the kind of mentors of mine that I've learned from, I it's, she's a Ellen Satter, who is a social worker and a dietitian who has been a researcher in the family feeding arena. So mm -hmm. really all about parent child feeding relationship. But I find so much of her material super relevant to the adult woman, man that is trying to relearn how to eat. Right. And that's so much of that. So I find there be like a reparenting of oneself mm -hmm. in eating disorder recovery, bringing in the same principles that we bring into the parents at the elementary school yeah. that are just doing this for the first time, bringing that into these adult um, clients that then they can use that to kind of reparent themselves mm -hmm. and relearn how to eat. And I, I love leaning into both of those and mm. thinking about that as a construct for healing one's relationship with food. Yep. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a therapist, like the conversation around reparenting yourself or mothering mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. kind of just in the, in a session, it's so normal and common, I think, mm -hmm. to be able to talk about that, what it means to grow self-compassion for yourself and self-validation, all these different things. And to actually translate that to literally mm -hmm. giving boundaries around food, mm -hmm. um, helping yourself figure out what it means to have permission and and boundaries and I mean just mm -hmm. all these different things mm -hmm. feels like a really cool concrete way to mm -hmm. to start building mm -hmm. and rebuilding relationship to self 
There are so many things we could talk about. I know. Oh my God, mm. I know. <laughs> <laughs> my mind is going down like more and more and more paths. Mm. Yeah. Like where? Um, like just in this moment, <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about desire and our cut right. off from desire. And that's a huge mm-hmm. hallmark of eating disorders. It's also part mm-hmm. of what I've I'm still working on <laughs> in mm-hmm. my own my own life, but um, just the the whole you know, especially with restrictive food disor- disorders with uh, anorexia and, and such, the restriction as a theme in one's life, right? Restriction from right. desire, the the fear of um, of of needing too much or mm-hmm. of um, you know gluttony or <laughs> there's a lot there is a lot around that mm-hmm. that theme that yeah. that we could also address, yeah. It feels like such an important question in this work to ask, like, okay, you're restricting with food. Where else, else are you restricting? restricting on? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Are you binging on food? Where yep. else are you binging? Yep. Because um, the parallels are just. They're all over. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Man, there are a lot of things to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I think that I can get really overwhelmed in mm. in which topic t- to mm. talk about. I mean, in preparing for this podcast, mm-hmm. I think that mm-hmm. when I start thinking about, oh, we could talk about exercise one day or we could mm. talk about this one day, it feels like every single conversation that we have, even if we try to focus it in, I would imagine it could mm-hmm. go in Lots of 10 yeah. to 15 mm-hmm. different directions and mm-hmm. sort of come back to a particular center. Mm-hmm. Um for me, I've been thinking, like, what is that center? Because some of the work that I think is really cool about eating disorders is that you do have this really um, specific, tangible um, part of a, of, a, of a person's life that is manifest in their relationship to food or their relationship to exercise to kind of work back from this really specific right tangible thing um into these larger more Mm -hmm. abstract more metaphorical things about someone's life and their psyche Mm -hmm. um and to me i think that when i when i imagine what all that goes back to it it then goes back to this sort of vitality Mm -hmm. issue or like you were saying kara desire Mm -hmm. can be in there too in a similar way Mm -hmm. do you guys think about it in that way at all is there sort of a core Mm -hmm. that you imagine I was just thinking about our mission, which Mm. I can't quote right now, (laughs) unfortunately. (laughs) But, Mm -hmm. you know, like a a live live in a world that that one can live fully in freedom, connection. (laughs) (laughs) Sarah, can you look it up? Yeah. I don't know. I'm like, that's what I just am like, oh, wait, what is it? Yeah. yeah, but I, yeah. I think about that mission statement because that's where mm-hmm. then it connects to living life fully mm-hmm. in these bigger, broader areas, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. right. freedom. Mm-hmm. Attunement. <laughs> attunement. It was freedman, freedom, <laughs> attunement. attunement. Yeah. Something in connection. Yeah. <laughs> and like if I, think of a, if I think of a core, um, I think of uh, the – in terms of the change process, mm-hmm. I think of the ability to take – in new information and change as a result. Mm -hmm. So can, if we speak about desire, can we understand our new um, relationship with desire and make changes that adapt Mm -hmm. to that new understanding? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or Mm -hmm. can we take in new information about identity and connection and make changes? Mm -hmm. So it's an adapt as adaptation, maybe the Mm -hmm. core of change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how I think of it. That makes me think about kind of – it feels like they're – I hear people doing a lot of transformative work in their own lives. And it it seems that people either – and this is a really broad generalization, I'm sure. But it feels like people often don't get to their, their work around their body until way later. It feels like it's still this interesting exception mm-hmm. to challenging different belief systems mm-hmm. um, that can kind of not ever go there. Mm-hmm. Um, you could think about your family of origin. You could think about mm-hmm. this. You could think about that. But yeah, you're people not that never be... present an eating disorder as an issue right. in their life. Exactly. You're kind of saying like general population. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They may never. They may never think yeah. about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that once you are in line with whatever your values are, you're willing to change, or you're willing to be more in touch with your desire. Mm-hmm. I think that it then starts going into all these different specific places. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that we catch people and get to work with people when they're very much caught in the specific Mm -hmm. and we're working them back outward Mm -hmm. um but 
think that if you're starting with a specific and I think, I mean, people go to therapy for all different kinds of reasons. Right. But, um, you can see how it starts like being in touch with that theme, being in touch with that, that core desire to transform and to be open means that you start becoming more and more and more open to things that you mm-hmm. didn't know that you were wanting yeah, to be open Or that about. you even knew you, you knew existed, right? Right, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, exactly. you go, well, most people go in, including, um, I know in my self-help therapy, you go in and there's just more, yeah, more than, more and more and more and more that gets opened up as you're in the change process. Mm-hmm. It's such an exciting really place. Yeah. <laughs> The curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's painful, but gosh, th- how exciting as we talk about it. I want to go do do it. <laughs> Whatever it is. <laughs> More there. <laughs> yeah. Just and talk- I know yeah. like what that's so terrifying. Mm-hmm. There's so many people I, I was discovering. And right? it is, that it is. is, but it's really exciting how is. we're talking about it. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. We're not talking of, we're not feeling the pain as we talk about it. Mm-hmm. So it can feel just really like, I want to go there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, yeah, I think some of even my most important work in my own process of therapy has been things that I didn't know were there. <laughs> and right. they've been almost like kind of this surprise gift. It wasn't even something that I went into to wanting growth or desiring growth, the growth. And then it's been this gift. So that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The other thing I get excited about, sorry, I'm going back to the excited about theme is, um, and these gals know I get pretty jazzed about temperament and differences of people and kind of both not, not, and I, when I say temperament, I don't mean static temperament. I mean, there's an interaction I think between, you know, nature and nurture and, um, but I, but just recognizing that people are different and really trying to understand, um, how differences in people can help us be more attuned to people and that that also can sync back up to connection and belonging and mm-hmm. um I love I love that discovery too so mm-hmm. I don't know I think that there's how that relates to eating disorder treatment I'd like to bring that in mm-hmm. to this podcast as well mm. I'm wondering about the Enneagram right, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering about that right now yeah I know you love it so it's much. It's a tool, yeah. And the Enneagram being a tool that I've I've really enjoyed mm-hmm. as a place of discovery. Mm-hmm. I think especially because it can be daunting. I, I think sometimes for, for the over-control person as well, having some of those tools um, makes it a little less intimidating as well as, you know, RODBT. That's a huge part of RODBT is that there's these skills and tools that allow people to, to gain um, – to, to heal and gain more understanding instead of it just being more vague. Um, mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. And I think of too, this, the kind of the emotion that I think we can connect on of like what that means to have depth of knowing of oneself and what that means in terms of relationship and all that stuff is mm-hmm. going to express and be different for each. Right. With depending on the temperament or depending on each person. And so I think too, it gives a lot of freedom for that unique expression of that because mm-hmm our level of what intimacy feels like to us and is what we're seeking is going to be different for different kinds of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that, yeah, that the, this kind of intensive work for different people is still everybody baseline. Everybody does need connection, mm-hmm. but that connection is going to look so different for different mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was thinking just even down to the, like the raw basics of like, but each, I mean, everybody does desire to eat with other human beings. It might just literally be one other person that they want to be able to eat with. Um, and that's their happy place <laughs> or some are going to like want to be able to go into this huge like open house and all these new people and like mm-hmm. be able to casually go and get their appetizers and their drinks and like enjoy themselves. Mm-hmm. Right. But that <laughs> somebody My that hell, no. <laughs> <laughs> get me away from the crowd, <laughs> <laughs> but you want to eat with more than one person I'll for the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. yeah. I know. I know. I know. The introverts over here. I'll lead the <laughs> way. I, the appetizer. I love going out to eat by myself. Yeah. I okay. also like, I mean, I like to talk to the people that work there. I like to sit at a bar mm. and have lunch or something yeah. and talk to everybody. So okay. I'm not technically alone. Okay. But, <laughs> but it's fun. Yeah. But you're like a cheer. Yeah. They know your name. Yeah. Is what you're I saying. love right. being in that position. Yeah. Sort of the cheers position. Yes. Regular. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's interesting because everybody, that means that people need to have ease when they're eating. Like mm-hmm. they have to be able to interact with food to be able to have, if it's coming alone to a place to eat or being... Um, with one other person that they feel safe with to be able to eat. But, every yeah, everybody mm-hmm. still needs to be able to have a relationship with food that nourishes their body and, like, can, they can interact with it and it not be the focus, um, an ultimate distraction in that. So I just think each person is going to 
land differently and maybe mm -hmm. express differently their food, <laughs> how they interact with food. Yeah. So hmm. it made me remember that I was going to ask earlier about like what what is wisdom? Oh. And that is such a huge question, obviously, it but it's it's interesting to think about it being really specific. Mm -hmm. I know that it's not mm -hmm. a catch all for everyone, but um, mm -hmm. thinking about it in terms of temperament and thinking about mm -hmm. it in terms of one's individual relationship to their body um, when we're working with people and moving them toward wisdom. Um, I think that there are a million different ways to approach that, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm curious about wisdom within our culture not being something that mm. is taught is talked mm -hmm. about a lot well trusting ourselves isn't yeah. taught that much i think the right it would that's be, where it's, our it's wisdom probably, is lands right. more in self in self-trust versus right than mm -hmm. external Knowing, information yeah, and being an expert at something right, right. yeah mm -hmm. but then also the combination of having some of that external information the knowledge but mm -hmm. then you're interacting with it with your own self mm-hmm Mm -hmm. experimenting it for your own yeah mm -hmm. experimenting with it for your own self mm -hmm. kind of place and going and having a lot of you know flops and failures along the way i mean i think that's the other part that's probably something to to talk about on a future podcast is uh, one of our values as a staff is we call it wabi sabi mm -hmm. and it's um, embracing imperfection and you know i think that's a hard thing for people is to embrace the embracing the failing embracing the screw ups um, and yet that's how we get information about ourselves too, is, is by trying out a lot of things and seeing what doesn't work, what works and what feels good and, you know, what, what supports your relationships. And, um, I know, gosh, all of our learning from Opal has been definitely mm. <laughs> true. <laughs> <screwing up. laughs> and then finding our way. Mm. We've really embraced we the We need to make a policy for that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. After we, um, what, one, one thought I have is, um regarding wisdom is the dialectic we a core dialectic in RODBT which is holding both wisdom and self-doubt mm -hmm. at the same time and I think it's interesting how this conversation mm -hmm. is highlighting both sides mm -hmm. of that dialectic how there is a strong you know interest in knowing ourselves and knowing our you know trusting our intuition trusting who we are but then mm -hmm. at the same time keeping one eye out for what we don't yet understand about mm -hmm. ourselves and getting curious about what's on the what's what's on the edge that we don't yet understand and mm -hmm. opening to that mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's such a process of forming identity to be able to do both of those things okay. at once mm -hmm. and that to me is eating disorder work as well mm -hmm. that it's about identity formation yeah crisis of identity when someone right. comes into treatment that's for sure mm -hmm. right and to be able to be both connected to yourself and start understanding mm. where you have strength and then also to be very clearly willing to start leaning into other people at the same time. Mm -hmm. Curious and open. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I didn't, an identity isn't um, something that can be unchangeable, I think. Mm -hmm. I think to have like a really strong yeah. sense of identity does not mean that you are That's on an static. island, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This that, is exciting. That, yeah, I know. I'm like, oh, I've got lots of ideas. I don't know if we're supposed to talk about them or write them down right yeah. now. I have ideas. <laughs> I think the other thing that's on my mind right now is that related to identity is like how, mm -hmm. um, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, that there is a way that one eats and sort of that is an expression of who you are and how that easily, we see that, of course, with somebody with an eating disorder that it very much so expresses something. Mm -hmm. But I also see it being more culturally normative now that, I think even the statement, like, I am, like, mm. fill in the blank. It could be gluten-free, vegan, vegetarian, mm. mm -hmm. dairy-free. Like, I am. Right. It's just an interesting, <laughs> interesting. Right. starting point. But anyway, yeah. so that would be a podcast mm. I'd like to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, then, um, yeah. and then just generally that I think I've been, I've been called in to so many different contexts to do a talk on healthy eating. Mm. So because of my credential as a registered dietitian nutritionist, mm -hmm. like I will come in and tell you what to do to oh, be a healthy eater. And I usually flip the, yes, I will come, I'll accept the invitation, but I kind of flip it <laughs> well, off, yeah, upside down. Nice. And yeah. That's great. But you know. A um, lot of people take that in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they like it. It's most of the time they're annoyed. No. Um, you know, people usually want the list of to do's that are mm. like the, okay, for, for me to do these things, then makes me this. Um, 
So mm -hmm. that would be another mm -hmm. topic that I get. There's a lot to talk about, I think, about mm -hmm. yeah. what is healthy. I know. When I yeah. often tell people that I work with eating disorders, they say, um, oh, that must be like a lot of like really healthy food that they're eating or something like that, right? Like, <laughs> right. Or, you know, yes. I, I eat with the clients, right? So I'm, yeah. I mention that sometimes in my job description okay. and, you know, like, oh, that must be a lot of like really healthy mm -hmm. food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I don't, I wouldn't call, I mean, it can be, yeah. yeah. And it's what food you, and yeah. we eat a lot of it and we eat everything. <laughs> and, All the time. Right. I mean, this right. idea that, that mm -hmm. treating eating disorders with health is is kind of an interesting one. Yeah. Instead, I think yeah. that we're treating eating disorders with freedom, right, and permission. with flexibility and permission. Yeah. Instead, yeah, right. and not believing that there are good or bad foods, right. and instead exposing people to life that there's a lot out there, and that mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to be open to it all. Mm -hmm. That's one of the misconceptions too of eating disorder treatment. You say you work with eating disorders, and people automatically think it doesn't apply to them, right? Right. Because if they don't have a diagnosable eating disorder, then they're off like it's it's mm -hmm. irrelevant. And mm -hmm. I just I'm excited mm -hmm. to challenge that with the listeners, too, on this podcast of what we do, even with the food and the relationship to food is relevant mm -hmm. for all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once again, it's this little microcosm metaphor of of how we are relating to ourselves or to mm -hmm. the world. So whether we're with an eating disorder or without mm -hmm. just our relationship to our bodies is mm -hmm. one that can tell us a lot about how we're relating to everybody else, yeah. to, you know, to ourselves in other ways as well. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to have a lot of fun things to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. And our plan is to bring in people too into some mm -hmm. of these conversations. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that'll be exciting. Mm -hmm. This feels like a natural place to stop. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us for our first episode of The Appetite. And thank you to Jack Straw Cultural Center for sound engineering, to Aaron Davidson for The Appetite's music, and to Opal's Sarah Taylor for production assistance and editing. You can find more episodes of The Appetite and subscribe on iTunes. If you want, you can learn more about us at opalfoodandbody.com and connect over Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.